Germany is very much split. Nobody was happy about me marrying Protestant. How do you tell the difference between the differences that make a difference and the differences that don't make a difference? We had really trouble and fights and also pain about not being together, really. If you say, this is what the church teaches and that's it, it's not loving. It's tough to see her go up and, and receive the Eucharist and communion without me. It really is. The one that I love the most is sitting right next to me and, and able to partake when I'm not. Can I envision a day of unity? In a certain way, I'm theologically obligated to envision it because Christ prayed for it. I would go down the street to the Catholic Church. I did not know the liturgy. I did not know the language, but I would cry and cry and cry. We did understand that Amy becoming Catholic was not isolated to her, but that God was calling us into a marriage of reconciliation. I think the problem is we're blaming the couple for a problem our churches have. The churches are divorced, not the couples. And until we can reframe this conversation around who's the problematic actor here, it's our churches and our continual inability to come together that impacts pastorally the ability of this family to live out their union and cohesion. To me, it's a reframing of the topic altogether. My name is Dan Olson. I am the director of the Ecumenical and Interreligious Office for the Archdiocese of Chicago here in the United States. Um, I really became interested in this particular topic of interchurch marriages when I was working in a parish, um, working and seeing couples struggling to live out their faith in connection to two distinctive Christian traditions. There's a vast spectrum. There's folks that are really not all that committed to their faith, what we might call a nominal Christian, now, in a sense, their lives are quite easy in the sense that they're not connected to their traditions a whole lot anyway. Decidedly, inter-church families would be those that are both committed to their respective traditions and living it out. Now, particular challenges come with that, though. We need to feel their pain. We need to hear their stories, listen to them, and understand the damage that disunity is doing to couples on a weekly basis. And I'll present to you for the first time Mr. and Mrs. Daniel Our relationship was getting a little further along and I could definitely feel that I was in love with this woman. I didn't really sense that I had any reservations about her being Catholic or myself being Protestant. However, I did know that my family might not be as comfortable with that. And there have been a lot of conversations uh, between not only my family but friends back home about different beliefs and traditions that we might hold. Regarding interchurch families, frankly, I would go back prior to the Second Vatican Council for Catholics, at least. Before that council, there was a lot of animosity. Um, Catholics didn't really view other Christians as Christians. I never had my own personal reservations about Daniel, just because I felt so loved and welcomed by the Protestants that I knew and that um, were my friends that me finding him obviously attractive, but then like for us being able to connect spiritually, especially, that kind of opened my eyes to, wow, there's this whole wealth of wisdom that my Catholic upbringing hasn't developed in me. In 1970, Pope Paul VI wrote what's called Matrimonia Mixta. Everything has to be in Latin for Catholics. Mixed marriage is he articulated a new understanding of marriage uh, related to interchurch and mixed marriage couples. It was still really, shall we say, frowned upon 
to marry outside the Catholic Church. It was something that was just becoming possible, one might say, uh, more freely done in Catholic churches. Four big stones in there, it's trust, love, communication. Um, we have a, have a whole booklet that we go through in our marriage preparation, and we have a sponsor couple, Deacon Carey and Ann Bork, that have been walking us through that journey. I think interchurch marriages are more typical now than they were just maybe five, ten years ago. It seems like we get more people coming into the church that from, are from different faith traditions. I feel that it's important for a couple to know who they are individually and then who would they be as a couple. Because if we don't look at how you were brought up in whatever faith tradition, you won't know how to do it together as a couple. Uh, what are examples of areas in which the two of you have different views, but you're both willing to respect these different views? I work at Christ the Redeemer. I, we both faithfully attend Mass. Daniel is Protestant. We both faithfully attend West Houston. And we're going through this marriage preparation process because we want to know who Jesus is. We want to understand who Jesus is. And that's what we both keep our eyes set on, that we want to know him and we experience him through each other. We don't know how many people are doing this every week as a couple trying to, you know, trying to find the beauty of the common ground that an inner church relationship does forge. But if the spirit is trying to say something to us, what is it? Well, every Sunday uh, I wake up at about 5.30 or 6, 6 o'clock when I want to sleep in and uh, come over to Christ the Redeemer and go to Mass at 7 a.m. and I'll meet Daniel here, probably about 6.45. Go to 7 o'clock Mass, which is the dark clock Mass, at least that's what her family calls it. And uh... Uh, We like to get here early so that we can look over the readings that are coming up. and Trying to get there about the same time, park, to, park next to each other so we can walk in. And so after that we usually get coffee, <laughs> that's priority one. We wait to grab our coffee till afterwards, and sometimes that's unfortunate for Bridget, but uh, it's so cool to, to be pulling in to that parking lot at Christ the Redeemer right, right as the sun's coming up. From getting coffee, we drive over to West Houston Church of Christ, and that's 10 or 15 minutes down the road, and then we do our service there, and that starts at 8.30. Once I moved to Houston and, and us going to Mass at 7 a.m. And, and my service at 8.30, there are so many continual themes that we've run into throughout our times here. It's been very refreshing for me to see the different ways that not only we've been more united throughout our, our spiritual discussions, but just how I think there's already some undertones of the way that the Spirit and God is, is leading us. If you remain in me and my word remain in you, ask for whatever you want, and it will be done for you. So that's the foundation for when we have these talks, is that there's a level of trust and security that what we say here, it's okay, say what you think, but you know, we, we want to discuss it, we want to push the envelope, we want to talk about these things, because if they go unspoken, then what does that do? We stay in our corners and then we both think we know everything and we don't know anything. <laughs> you know, so it's just, we have to talk about it. Oh, this is my body, which will be given up for you. Even though it is kind of a, a man-made construct, in my opinion, that we're not necessarily able to partake together, I think we both understand the true meaning that we are partaking together, but just not at the same time. Take this, all of you, and drink from it. For this is the chalice of my blood. We still understand that it is representative and is the body of and blood of Christ. All the forgiveness of sin. We'll both talk through it, but in a way that's inviting and loving to one another. So I don't say, you know, declarative sentences. I say things that will invite him to give his opinion or his experience. If you say, this is what the church teaches and that's it, 
it's not loving. You have to want to invite people into that conversation. When I go up to receive the Eucharist and Daniel, he'll usually stay in the pew and there will be several people who stay in the pews, not a ton, but there are some who stay. It's hard because I want to enter into that with him. So receiving the Eucharist is a very communal okay. event and a communal moment. And so for him not to be able to do that is definitely difficult knowing that we love the same Jesus and we know the same Jesus. That's really, it is tough. For me personally, yeah, it's it's tough to see her go up and, and receive the Eucharist and communion without me. It really is. Even though there might be others in the pew, that doesn't make it any different because the one that I love the most is sitting right next to me and, and able to partake when I'm not. Everybody just assumes that he's Catholic. They don't ask, they just assume because we go to Mass together, he volunteers at Christ the Redeemer, he's extremely faithful in us being together and doing things together that they just assume that he's Catholic. Or when you tell them, they're like, oh, but he's gonna become Catholic, right? And I'm like, well, no, we're not, I'm not in this relationship to make him Catholic. I'm in this relationship to grow in love with him. Because of the gospel of Jesus Christ, he makes hope, healing, and home available to us. We're here in this place this morning to just make much of Jesus, to lift his name higher. So one of the things that I love about marriages like Daniel and Bridget is that they are an example for us as the church of what it means to come alongside each other and love and unity and live together in peace and harmony despite our doctrinal differences. We may not have the same belief set when it comes to our doctrines or our practices, but we can still love each other and support each other. You know, it was the Lord who prayed earnestly that His church would be one. And so that's where the trust has just really evolved for us in our relationship where I feel like I can share my full self. I can share how beautiful I think Catholicism is with him because he's not gonna use it against me. He's not gonna hold it against me. We come with all sorts of baggage, with brokenness. But God, you don't look at that when you look at us. You look at us with the eyes of a loving father. Me speaking from personal experience, getting to know more about her Catholic faith, it, it brings you deeper into the love and, and the knowledge of God. There's no other relationship that I've had where I experience Christ's depth than when I'm with Daniel and when we can have discussions and when we can talk it out and make decisions together and challenge myself to be more like Christ. We just pray that you would be with them these last three weeks as they prepare for this wedding. God, we pray that this wedding would glorify you and honor you. And most importantly, God, we pray that you would take away the stress that goes with planning and help them to just really enjoy this moment. It's the inquisitiveness that comes with the mystery of the love relationship to some point, I think, so. Um, and that surpasses a religious sect. That's much deeper to me than just putting ourselves in these boxes, Catholic, Protestant. It's followers of Christ, disciples, human beings, creatures of God, you know, on that journey to discover one another and live in communion. No longer can we see Christianity as limited to my tradition alone? And then by inviting others into the experience, whether it's family members or pastors that they have, um, to break open some of our past categories of this alone is what church must look like, this alone is what Christianity is, until we begin to see other Christians as gifts for our own understanding of Christianity, we will never move forward as a, as a Christian church united together.
I'm Gwen White. I live in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. I've been here about 25 years. My work as a psychologist here has been in the academic sphere as well as in the clinical sphere. I'm actually in an Anabaptist tradition, but the broad range of Protestants is certainly where I would fall. And I began Circle Counseling, the counseling centers that I continue to direct. Those began in 1997. We see couples and families and individuals who are interested in exploring the intersection of faith and psychology. Over the years, I've seen a number of couples who have been working out all kinds of various differences, but particularly related to uh, differences in their religious practice and working out how that impacts their relationship, what it might mean as they begin families. In my practice, I've probably seen couples that wrestled with this tension of inner church work within the context of their marriage. Maybe, maybe 25 or 30 percent of the couples coming. So if a couple comes to see me and they are both deeply committed to their religious practices, which are different, that can be a pretty complex territory to navigate. The wife always dreamed of having uh, her family, her husband sitting close to her at church and the children with them. Now he may also come with his own fantasies about what it meant to be in a family, building his own family, that he envisioned his wife next to him in the pew also. So they're giving up old pictures of what their family unit was going to look like. So there's loss in that. We have to talk about the emotions related to that. When we meet new people, people don't come up and immediately think, oh, she's Catholic, oh, he's Protestant, you know? They don't see that. They see this is a married couple, they love each other, they're united, they work together. So Thomas and I began a ministry called the Austin House of Prayer um, around the year 2000. We were both drawn to prayer, we were both falling in love with the Lord in new ways. Mm -hmm. We loved worship. In that place, I remember saying, Lord, I love you so much, I will do anything you want, thinking that maybe he would send us to the mission field. But instead, he broke my heart for division within the church. I remember talking with one of my friends who was Catholic and she expressed the pain that she had over the fact that we could not share Eucharist. And the Lord broke my heart. It was a physical pain that pushed me to the floor. And I remember grieving and thinking, well, maybe the Lord has called us to pray for reconciliation. But then I found more and more my heart was drawn to the Catholic Church. I found that the, the ways of praying that I used to pray, which I loved and I knew were wonderful, I could not relate to anymore. But I would go down the street to the Catholic Church, which was in Spanish. I did not know the liturgy, I did not know the language, but I would cry and cry and cry. And I would get up the next morning and do it again. And eventually, Thomas and I began to discern that this was the Lord drawing me into the Catholic Church. Bless you, God, forever. I began working with the youth there. I began falling in love with the liturgy. I began reading Church Fathers. Bless you, God, forever. And my heart was turned. It's not that I did not love the church that I grew up in. I loved the church that I grew up in. I loved the ways that I had been taught, but my heart was changing. And in this context, I found that the way we were praying in the house of prayer, I could not relate to as well anymore. When I kind of realized that Amy was serious about becoming Catholic, I would say I didn't react by kind of a fear, what I would describe as a fear-based response, like, oh no, what, you know, how are we gonna raise our children? 
and I, it's not it's just because that's not my personality um, I'm always up for something new <laughs> but what I would say is that we did understand that Amy becoming Catholic was not isolated to her but that God was calling us into a marriage of reconciliation so there's a beauty about embracing the difficulty of the division as a as a crown, as a glory, as a challenge. And that's very different than being afraid of, you know, insist on raising the children Catholic, but I want them raised Protestant. It's very different to say, we together are embracing this as a calling to reconciliation. And then you make decisions based on that. We have two older children. One is a Protestant serving overseas, and the other is a married Catholic woman. And we could tell by the time I would think they were six or seven years old that Noah was going to be Protestant and Peggy was going to be Catholic. We could just tell. It's important to honor the other stream. It's important to appreciate and, and participate in the other stream. So I think the, the Catholic priest who told Amy at the very beginning, if you become Catholic, you know, I'm now your priest and I can kind of give you instruction in life. And my instruction is you have to keep going to your Protestant church. I mean, that was a man with great wisdom. And so he really set the tone for, you know, which church will we attend? Well, both. Usually we go into Hope Chapel and we usually do that all as a family. And then mom goes to um, her Catholic church, Sacred Heart, and about once a month, we all go to the Sacred Heart as well. I think a lot of couples initially solve the problem by going to two places. They both attend one another's church services. They try to do everything together. Often I see the problem coming in when kids enter the picture because now choices have to be made uh, about the kids and just the complexity of getting two or three kids organized and out the door on a Sunday morning. Our approach to our children has been twofold. One is we just live our life. Lift up your hands, this is normal life to them to pray every day, to pray for the unity of the body of Christ, to know what the strengths of the Orthodox are. This is just normal life. For them. On the other hand, my wife is very intense and our children know this. So there's times when suddenly something comes up and Amy will speak very passionately and very intensely and they soak that in. They love it. John Patrick recently described Amy to one of his friends like she's she's a preacher and a teacher and and a mother and she cooks and she cries while she talks to you know. She, so he has this image of his mother as this beautiful, passionate, but normal person. When the kids are old enough to make some choices of their own and to express their will related to which of these faith practices, or maybe none of these faith practices that they'll choose as their own, I, I think for the parents that's another real hurdle, an emotional hurdle, because you don't want them to pick the other faith practice. If this has been meaningful to you, you want your children to find meaning there too. And you want a shared experience ongoing with your children, particularly if they're teenagers, when developmentally, they're moving away from you. I don't feel pressured at all by my parents to choose either way. They're very, um, they're very good about showing the, uh, the strengths and weaknesses of both churches and the different abilities of both churches. I, I would say I'm leaning more towards the Protestant church, but I was um, baptized in the Catholic church. Yeah, I've been raised in um, both churches, but I feel like I've been called more to the Protestant church. That might change over time. This choosing between mom's faith practice and dad's faith practice can really pose a, a dilemma. I don't want to hurt mom and I don't want to hurt dad. I don't even know how to think about this just from my own perspective. 
it gets very cloudy for kids. And they're trying to differentiate. They're trying to be separate. Again, it's, the problem is the fact that these children have to make these choices. It, it's the problem of disunity. It's not the problem of their being called to live out their faith uh, within the evangelical tradition. It's that that very act distances themselves from their Catholic parent because our churches remain in division. You know, when I'm in Amy's church and I go forward and cross my arms instead of holding my hands out to receive, the Catholic priest knows what that means and gives me a blessing. I think if every Catholic would understand, and, and other Christians too, the impact that that particular moment has in your church families, the ecumenical movement would move at warp speed. I, I, I really think that until we see the pain that this moment of sacramental disunity has for these couples, we'll never get past our divisions. We need to feel their pain. It's still very painful, and so I always try to turn that pain into a prayer and say, my prayer is really this, oh for the day, oh for the day. And what that is short for is, oh for the day when Amy and I can legitimately, without dishonoring either stream, share the table of the Lord, the sign of unity of the body of Christ together as a married couple. And I believe that day will be in our lifetime. We started a for-profit business in 2004. It has grown year over year since then, and now we distribute a water called Cielo, which is a Spanish word for heaven or sky. Through the city of Austin, through central Texas, and actually out into the whole southwest region, Louisiana, Arkansas, Oklahoma, and all of Texas. Through retailers such as Whole Foods. Also, we deliver directly to businesses and offices. So when we founded Cielo, we wanted our water to be a premium water. We purify it essentially to the greatest extent possible, but then we dissolve oxygen into it, and so it lightens and sweetens the taste, the texture of the water. We have people tell us all the time, this is the best tasting water, or this is the sweetest water I've ever tasted. Our children work at Cielo, other people from the community come to work at Cielo. So our funds go to support a nonprofit, namely Christ the Reconciler, the cause of reconciliation and prayer. And people actually, you know, whether they're followers of Jesus or not, respond very positively to the idea of reconciliation. We're not delivering water, the water is delivering us. The Christ the Reconciler is a community of Catholics and Protestants who come together to pray and to work and to do spiritual formation in terms of retreats. We have several values. One is prayer. Um, another is worship in our local church context. But we also want to live life together and explore the promise that Jesus gives us that we will be one as Jesus and the Father are one. This is what he prays for. And so we are praying for this on a broad level, but also know that it will be worked out in individual relationships. So it is our dream to live closely together and to work closely together. And Cielo has a very critical role in that. Because we have this product, all of a sudden we are distributed as a community all through the city of Austin. You know, in Whole Foods, in coffee shops, at a person's house, at a person's business. We can be praying, we can look for opportunities to share the gospel, you know, we can look for opportunities to step in and serve and help. God has more in this than just making money. It's a holistic view of how work fits in and dignifies people inside of a community context and enables them to serve. One of the challenges that interchurch couples face, particularly when they get engaged, leading up to the wedding, is what's the family going to think? So thinking about couples, younger couples, let's say first, who are meeting the parents for the first time and suddenly these faith tradition differences come out, that can really be awkward. Parents tend to 
assume that their children will marry someone like them. And they really don't consider variations on that theme until they have to. Most of us are tethered to a particular community because our parents were and, and their parents were. Uh, so it's a familial belonging that often exists as an evangelical Christian or as a Catholic Christian. So what do you do when your child as a Catholic decides, I want to marry a, a Lutheran? The sense of betrayal, the emotional upheaval that comes up for people, and when they can't manage that, they really say awful things. And that's, that's just adding more to what the couple needs to navigate. I do think this is partly generational, where um, 30, 40 years ago, it was much bigger of a deal, so to speak, to, to parents. Partly because it was much more rare, and also the sense of ecclesial belonging was really strong in ways I think it are changing, at least in American culture today. Denominations as a whole are becoming far less important. And the statistics tell us they're declining. Many people are leaving their original family traditions in order to forge a new kind of relationship with God and with a community of faith. I was born and raised here in Waldhausen in a very Catholic environment as my family uh, was the ruling family so all the villages surrounding us are Catholic. I'm raised up in a very little small village in Castell but in a big castle and I'm raised up Lutheran Protestant. Germany is very much split from Still. village to village, from town to town, from family to family. And in old days, you wouldn't marry a Protestant uh, being Catholic and the other way around. And you would not move to a Catholic village being a Protestant. Since the uh, Thirty Years' War, which was a war between Protestantism and Catholicism, 1618 to 1648. The peace agreement was that the landlord decided about the believing of the region. And so my family decided that our region becomes Catholic. Her family decided that their region becomes, becomes Protestant. And who didn't want to do that, had to leave the country. And when we uh, fell in love together, there were some expectations from outside uh, whether I would convert to be Catholic from my parents-in-law. But I said no, but I couldn't really explain it. So we went on a retreat for one week and it was all about Jesus. And this retreat was very good for us because we heard the same things and we could discuss. And then we decided to give our life to Jesus on the end of this, of this retreat and it was before we married. So then we got married in a Lutheran church in my home. Nobody was happy about my family about me marrying a Protestant. It was really harsh reactions from my family. So that forced me and us as a couple to define the way we work, walk together. So I had to stop all interventions from my family and to, to tell them that what I saw in Castell family, it was a Lutheran family, that there is something which is worth being taken into consideration. 
We had a big group of friends who had the same situation. So we met once a year and we talked about baptism, confirmation, um, all these topics where we think different. We always had a priest and a, a Protestant pastor with us. So they, they told us the, the both sides and we could decide, we could find our ways. When we organized these meetings, we did that almost 10 years. It helped a lot to find this way and to get the help of others and exchange of views. It was very, very hard because we had, we had really trouble and fights and also pain about not being together, really. So it was a very good time, but uh, it struggled, it struggled. And it struggled also our children, but they, because they knew this difference, and sometimes they ask us, are we Catholic or are we Lutheran? So that was always my prayer that we, we can raise our children with a bigger mind than we had when we got married. So they're really aware of unity, they're aware of if you talk badly about the other confession, they were very conscious about these things. As a child, you want to have clear leading. You do yeah, want one explanation mm -hmm. and not two. Mm -hmm. So take the subject of how do we deal with the saints or with Maria. There you get two answers. I am used to ask others for help and prayers. And so I would tend to ask the saints for prayer for me. Philippa would never do that. <laughs> so for children that brings some insecurity and insecurity they hate, basically. We feel it's an important point. As a couple, we are united in every aspect, but we shall not share Holy Communion. It's an awful situation. We have 19 grandchildren. Three of them are Protestant because one of our daughters married a Protestant uh, believer. So it would separate our family in very important moments of life. And the baptize between Protestant and Lutheran is acknowledged being baptized in Christ. Why shouldn't we have communion with him? That's not to be understood. How shall we praise the loving God and God Father, the Lord, by showing struggle and fight between Christianity, inside Christianity? We will never have a, a peaceful, happy and united message. So John 17 tells that very strictly. Uh, stay united to show mm. face to the world. That's our motto, to show that even coming from different roots, from different ways, we, can, we are united in Him and we stay together and we love each other. It was in 1535, right at the start of the Reformation in Europe, when a group of Anabaptists took over the city of Münster by force. All the Catholics were expelled, including their bishop, von Waldeck. This infuriated the Catholics, of course. So Bishop Waldeck rallied an army to lay siege to the city for almost a year. 
who is most anabaptized within Münster starving, the city fell to Waldeck's army. Three of the anabaptized leaders were tortured and killed. Their bodies were hung in cages at the cathedral. I knew the story because my father is born in Münster. And so the cages he showed me when I was a child. Philippa's mother comes from the Waldeck family. So as we heard that the Catholic Church was seeking reconciliation for this as part of Katholikentag, the annual Catholic conference, which takes place in Münster this year, we were very much moved and we had the desire to have a reconciliation liturgy in the St. Lamberti Church in Münster, where these cages still hang to this day. I will be attending the event on Friday with a small group of Anabaptist and Lutheran leaders who are staying here in our home. I was a, a part of a group of, of leaders who were invited from the Mennonite Church to be a part of this gathering there in, in Munster. And we gather together and have a chance to spend time again in the context of Prince Michael and Philippa's place. Yes, Lord, what does it mean for this gathering in Munster to be a gathering of individuals with open hearts? In that context then, partway through, some German Anabaptist leaders come and join us, a Dutch Anabaptist leader comes and joins us, and we begin to interact as a team, but we had never all met each other before. I don't know how to put it into words, it was just a, an incredible experience of being with a family, getting to know that family, but then also being able to pray with and for that family in the context of what they were already involved in, what they were doing. Uh, and that kind of set the stage, really, for what we were going to do as we went up to Munster. It be an experience in Munster in these next days of hearing and seeing as you are resident. These are historic events that have never happened before. They may have happened other places, but in this particular place, as I understand it from Philippa, this had never happened before. Catholics, Anabaptists, Lutherans, all together in worship with the liturgy, but all of them up front participating and leading the liturgy. We want to ask God and each other for forgiveness for the reciprocal violence and persecution between Roman Catholic, Evangelical and Anabaptist Christians in Münster in the years 1534 to 1535. The three Anabaptist cages hanging above on the tower of the Lamberti Church in all their cruelty serving as a reminder of these transgressions. It was kind of surreal, like, I'm here, I'm connecting in this context with people who are linked to my past. Let the Anabaptist cages on the steeple of Lamberti Church be an admonition and a reminder to us today. Never again shall Christians use violence against each other. Lord, help us to not see them anymore as a sign of irreconcilability, but rather as a reminder for peace among ourselves. Here we are together and watching the Spirit of God move to bring reconciliation between strangers, but who are connected by history. We feel deep regret and pain over the persecution of the Anabaptists by the Lutheran authorities and especially that this persecution was supported theologically. We ask God and our Mennonite sisters and brothers for forgiveness. I've read through my lines and it hits me. I'm here in this church as a part of a significant historic event and I, I mean, really honestly, I was moved to tears standing up there, wanting to keep my composure. There's still other parts I have to do, but recognizing this is more than I imagined. Here today in Münster, we as Mennonites regret the words and deeds of those past Anabaptists who contributed to the destruction of the body of Christ. 
you have to imagine kind of back 500 years, this all happened. There's this division, this split, this, you know, we're enemies. From enemies to reconciliation. How does that happen? Catholics can express a willingness to repentance. Ask for forgiveness for all sins that we have committed against Mennonites. Call for God's mercy and call upon God's spirit for a new relationship to the Mennonites today. And maybe a place for us to look at is, is there something we can learn from this that helps us to understand that we don't need to take 500 years to come to a place of reconciliation? Yes, we really pray and hope that that will be a time to open, to open the hearts and to, to get some reconciliation for the body of Christ. It must be, everything is for the body of Christ. For, for Michael and Philippa, as a Catholic and a Protestant in a marriage, working in that context uh, with a passion to see the things that, that, that are common ground in the midst of the places where we know we have differences. I do think in very real ways that interchurch couples provide us with a vision to the future. Now, in a sense, I find this is unfair to these, these couples. They shouldn't be forced into the positions of testing out what works or doesn't work for the future church. Be that as it may, that's in a position that they tend to be in right now. They're, they have to think through ways to live out their Christian existence together in ways the rest of us aren't forced to. We don't give enough credence to these dialogues that are occurring in the lives, the spiritual lives of individuals, and in this case, interchurch families. God, we thank you for the gift of love. We need to pay more attention to the gifts that they're offering, what they're showing us in terms of the way forward for the ecumenical movement. Are you prepared, as you follow the path of marriage, to love and honor each other for as long as you both shall live? I, I am. The dream of church unity is still a pretty magnificent dream. I, Bridget, take you, Daniel, to be my husband. I promise to be faithful to you in good times and in bad, in sickness and in health, to love you and to honor you all the days of my life. I hope we quit cutting up the pie in so many small pieces and learn to enjoy the grace that we've been given as one family in Christ. And I'll present to you for the first time, Mr. and Mrs. Daniel Richardson. What can I learn from my husband and my wife? How can I enrich my faith? Where are our wounds, our lacks, our needs? And what can we learn from other traditions of the faith? This approach of receptive ecumenism is proving to be a rich phase now in the ecumenical movement. It's just become like this dream of mine. What can God do with a church if we can all be united? What could God do with a city if we're all to come together in the name of Christ? That's my deepest desire, and I'm just every day trying to help make that happen.
what holds us together in unity is the capacity to be with each other, to honour each other, to nurture each other, to support each other in our differences, to have really fine arguments, to have deep relationships that flourish within our public disagreement. You know, one of us is probably right, <laughs> but we're not sure who it is. So in the meantime, I think we ought to hold our convictions strongly and at the same time figure out, is there some way we could come to an agreement? I'm interested in how people live and how they love, not just what their opinions are. My starting point isn't suspicion, is he one of us? My starting point is the love of Christ. Love is the only thing that can create true unity. In other words, we confused uniformity with unity. And we Catholics certainly did. We spent hundreds of years expecting you Protestants all to come back to Mother Church, and then we'd have unity. The biggest reconciliation journey I will ever make is the one within myself. And if I begin to get that one right, then any outer journey of unity or reconciliation becomes gloriously possible. By definition, the church is the place where the struggles about unity, diversity, holiness and authority are always going to be happening. It's only when we sit down in, in friendship to, to have that conversation that then we realize we really do agree about so much. We will not be clever enough to organize the reunion of the churches, but God can do that. So our task is to discern and to cooperate with the movement that we see the Spirit engaged in. Love must sustain it at every level. And thank God, we understand that better, I think. But love should sustain a very serious uh, quest for the truth. In that truth, we're gonna find unity. More and more, there are couples of real faith that are Catholic and Protestant who are a beautiful illustration of a kind of an icon, a window through which we can see how unity actually works in an intimate relationship. Mm -hmm.